One of the patients that I'm taking care of in the hospital right now was feeling completely fine until out of nowhere, when he was just sitting at home watching TV, he started to feel short of breath. When a person comes into the hospital feeling short of breath, we run through the most common causes. You know, is heart failure causing fluid to back up in their lungs? Do they have a collapsed lung? Are they having an exacerbation of their COPD? Do they have some sort of infection? Maybe they're having a heart attack. Do they have a blood clot in their lung? Now, for the most part, it's usually one of these things. We can identify the cause. We can give them antibiotics if they're infected. We can give them diuretics if they need to get rid of extra fluid blood thinners if they have a clot, or if they have a clogged vessel in their heart, we can open it back up. And usually we can send them home feeling a lot better. But this patient was different because like millions of others, this patient has a history of cancer. Right? He had lung cancer that was discovered in 2019. He underwent a combination of chemotherapy, radiation, and immunotherapy, and the cancer responded very well to the treatment. He would see his oncologist every six months to get imaging done, and every time he got the good news that the cancer was nowhere to be found. But like every cancer survivor I've ever met, since 2019, he'd been walking through life, constantly looking over his shoulder. See, cancer curses you with this hyper-awareness of your body, every twinge of pain, every cough, every ache. It's accompanied by the question that never entirely leaves your mind. Is that the cancer coming back? That was the question on this patient's mind as he presented to a nearby hospital. He had a CT scan of his lungs done. And because of the fragmented nature of our healthcare system, the hospital doing his CT scan, they had no access to any of his prior CTs. But they did see something very concerning. Part of his lung, the exact area where his cancer had been, was now collapsed in on itself. He was transferred to our hospital for further workup. And the sign out that I got was that he was coming in with a recurrence of his cancer. Now. I want to tell you what ended up happening with this case because it is pretty wild. But first, let's answer this question. Why does cancer come back? Why is it so hard to treat? The answer might surprise you. Hi guys, my name is Ryan. I'm a medical doctor. I have a PhD in cancer biology and I'm a YouTuber with a hundred subscribers. Thank you so much for subscribing. A hundred, this is a milestone. You know, my goal with this channel is to make cancer understandable to anyone and to try to teach you to think critically about medical and scientific claims. And at least a hundred people are interested in that. Now, one of these subscribers is my mom and I know that more than wanting to learn about cancer or understand how to think critically about data, she just loves me. And if that's why you're here, that's cool too. So, why does cancer sometimes come back? And you know, in answering this question, we're also gonna learn a little bit about why it's so difficult to treat cancer in the first place. First of all, cancer is different from most diseases in that it comes from our own cells. A lot of diseases come from some external organism that enters our body, either bacteria, virus, or fungus. You know, and we can treat those with antibiotics because the makeup of these foreign invaders is so different from our own cells that we can pretty easily apply an antibiotic that can, for example, you know, uniquely tear apart a bacterial cell wall, totally kill the bacteria, and really not have much of an effect on our cells at all. Cancer comes from us, okay? It's very difficult to design any drug that will uniquely target cancer cells and not just kill the rest of our own normal cells. And that's because the actual structural and biological differences between cancer and our normal cells, the differences are very subtle, okay? They're important, but it's very hard to exploit those differences in terms of therapeutics. And you know, doing this has been the holy grail of cancer research for a long time, which is to find a way to uniquely target cancer cells while sparing the rest of our cells. And while we're getting better at it, the reason that chemotherapy is so terrible and can cause people to feel very sick and lose their hair and all sorts of other terrible things is that the drugs we use to kill cancer cells end up killing a lot of our own normal cells as collateral damage. Okay, so that's just one part of it. But a second part is just how evolutionarily dynamic a tumor is. Evolution is this remarkable thing that affects our lives in so many ways. All living things are locked in a constant battle for survival the survival of the fittest, as you may have heard. And so things are constantly changing and evolving. Now, evolution happens on different time scales for different organisms. Take you and I, for example. Okay, humans live very long lives. We have relatively few children, all right? The evolutionary changes in humans are not detectable by us at all. If you took a human that lived even hundreds of thousands of years ago and you put them on the bus seat next to you, you would not bat an eye, okay? To really see some differences, you would have to go back millions of years. You know, take one of the early humans from then, you set them on a bus next to you, then you might sense something is up. And that's because 
of our long lifespans and then the relatively low number of children that we have. And because of that, it takes thousands and thousands of generations for evolution's invisible hands to craft noticeable changes in us. On the other end of the extreme are cells. Okay, evolution acts on cells just as it acts on us. But a new generation of humans comes along every 20 to 30 years. A new generation of cells is born every day. A new cell is born, grows to maturity, and can reproduce by dividing again all in the same day. This means that evolution can happen very quickly at the cellular level. And this is what happens with tumors. A tumor starts out as one cell. One cell that has acquired all the mutation it needs to become cancer, and it divides. And those cells divide again, and again, and it grows into a tumor, okay? And the tumor is made up of clones of that first cancer cell, exact copies, because it is that exact programming that makes the cell divide and grow like crazy. So it keeps dividing and dividing and making copies of itself over and over until there are millions and then billions of clones of that cell all mashed together in a tumor. Now, in order to get to that point, there have been thousands of divisions. Remember, with each division, there are mutations that arise. Now, most of the mutations have no effect at all, so nothing really happened. But eventually, you get a cell that gets some combination of mutation that makes it even a little bit better than that original clone. Okay, it grows a little faster, maybe it's a little better suited to the environment. And so then it starts to grow and compete with the original dominant clone. After months or even years, now this becomes the dominant clone. Okay, so now we have this tumor, and it's not monoclonal, meaning just one clone. It's now polyclonal, okay? It's made of multiple subclones. Now this process continues again and again, and in the end, often by the time we've discovered a tumor in somebody, it is a collection of several subclones of populations, all mixed together in one tumor. And these later clones are separated from the original tumor cell by thousands and thousands of divisions, thousands and thousands of generations. Okay, so to put that into perspective, thousands and thousands of human generations would take us back hundreds of thousands, even millions of years, okay? So the evolutionary distance between that first tumor and the late stage tumor cell is the same as the difference between us and chimpanzees, okay? So a lot can change in that many generations. So when we finally find out that someone has a tumor in their lungs, what we do is we usually get a biopsy, okay? A biopsy is when we take a tiny piece of that tumor that we can look at and we identify what type of tumor it is. But we really just do not have the bandwidth to fully sequence every cell in every tumor and get a truly representative look to tell us about the unique genetic makeup of all the subclones that make up a tumor. That's okay because we can still get a general idea of what type of tumor it is, and then we can hit it with everything we've got. Okay, we can use surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, targeted therapies that will inhibit the genes that are driving the cancer's growth. We can use immunotherapy to unleash our immune system to kill the cancer cells. For the most part, this works pretty well. Often, you know, we totally wipe out the tumor. But the problem is, you know, maybe our surgery got most of the tumor, but there were still some cells that we just didn't get. And then chemotherapy. You know, the chemotherapy, it was good at killing some of the subclones, but other subclones were more resistant. After treatment, when we look for evidence of the tumor, lots of times we don't see anything. The tumor is completely gone. But well below our ability to detect, a handful of cells from one of the subclones may be there, bruised and battered and barely hanging on, but nevertheless there. And then slowly, as time goes on, they recover and begin dividing again for a few years undetected, and then they get large enough that something happens. You feel something. Just like my patient, there's this sudden shortness of breath and the fear that this time it could be the cancer. Now, I wanna say, this doesn't always happen. Okay, sometimes, even a lot of times, we're able to blast that tumor with everything we've got and it completely wipes it out and it never comes back. Victory. But once you understand that cancer is not a single disease, but rather a collection of unique subclones that will all react differently to treatment, and that no two cancers are alike. Okay, my patient's lung cancer is completely unique to him. It's made up of his unique cell and his own unique combination of subclones. And the way we'll react to treatment is different than every other person. 
Okay, and you put that on top of the fact that the cells that make up cancer are so similar to our normal cells. I cannot emphasize enough how difficult it is to make a drug that will attack only the cancer cells and leave the rest of our cells alone. Then you start to understand why finding a cure for cancer is so difficult and why sometimes, even after we throw everything we have at these tumors, they find a way to come back. And because of evolution, when this happens, when people's cancer returns, it is now made up of cells that are resistant to our conventional therapies, right? Because we have selected for this small group of cells that were resistant to our therapy in the first place. We killed every other cell that was sensitive to our treatment, and all that remains are these hardy, resistant cancer cells. And now they have grown to create a tumor that is even harder to treat than before, okay? But I wanna tell you about some cool research that is happening on this front. Because treating these recurrent cancers is so difficult, what some researchers are trying to do is, is to take a sample of someone's tumor and then growing in a lab what's called an organoid. An organoid is a 3D tumor grown in a dish, and it is made from a patient's own cancer cells. And then we can try in the lab to find the exact right cocktail of drugs that will actually kill this person's tumor. In the lab, we can try dozens, even hundreds of combinations of drugs all on this organoid. And we can see immediately if the tumor responds. And once we find the right combination, we can go back into the clinic and use that same combination of drugs to treat the patient. A completely personalized approach that allows us to tailor our treatment to the unique character of an individual tumor. This is awesome. And I think that as time goes on, it will become more and more prevalent as we get better and better at tailoring our therapies to each individual patient that comes into the clinic. Okay, so what happened to my patient? Well, we tried to get a copy of the CT scan from the outside hospital, but for completely annoying reasons, we weren't able to get it. And meanwhile, this patient is worried that his cancer is back and growing again in his lungs, and he wants answers. So we decided to just get a repeat chest CT, and the part of the lung that had been collapsed on the previous imaging at the outside hospital was totally reinflated. There was no tumor to be found, no collapsed lung. What had likely happened was something called a mucus plug. A little bit of mucus can sometimes plug up a part of your lung and cause it to collapse. Now, in someone who has previously had cancer in that part of a lung, and they show up to the hospital with a new lung collapse in that region, it almost always means there's a mass that has returned there and caused the collapse. But in the time of the patient being transferred from the outside hospital to our hospital, the mucus plug must have dislodged. Okay, and then the lung reinflated. So then we were able to see the area perfectly with a CT scan and find that there was in fact no mass at all. This was awesome. This was a great day because I have to say, so often as doctors, we have to deliver the worst news people will ever hear in their entire lives. And I am just not well equipped for that. I don't know who is well equipped for that, okay? I mean, I know I'm getting kind of old, but look at this youthful, you know, charismatic demeanor, okay? I'm just a child. Right? How am I supposed to be telling people that their father or mother or daughter has only days to live? It is the worst part of a job that honestly has a lot of pretty bad parts. But when things like this happen and you get to tell people that the cancer has not come back, it is the best feeling in the world. And with new amazing research coming out every day, I suspect that I'll be having that feeling more and more often.